There we go. Okay. All right. Welcome everyone tonight. We're so excited to have you here tonight. Pam Gothart is going to be your presenter. She ha earned her educational specialist degree and has been working in professional learning for 20 plus years, including eight of those in social studies. She also has gotten several grants, which is where we made our first introduction. So she also served as teaching social studies teachers through a Teach American History grant. And it was a fabulous experience. Not only that, she also um, has chickens and rabbits that she raises and all of her grands. And she is just an amazing person. I cannot wait to learn more about the atlases tonight and geography in elementary. Pam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Melissa. That was so sweet. I appreciate that. And uh, welcome, everybody. We're just so glad that you could spend a little time with us this afternoon, uh, letting us talk with you about geography in the elementary grades and what all we can do with you and the role that it plays. So let's just go ahead and jump in and get started tonight. In terms of our agenda, I want us to look at the Atlas through the eyes of literacy, Bigger, and then, of course, our geography theme. It's amazing what wonderful opportunities we have with our atlases to incorporate more literacy and literacy strategies. And we all work with literacy and readers all the time, but just to kind of re-emphasize here, I wanted to just bring that out a little bit. So when we talk about literacy, we're talking about ways that we're able to communicate printed and written materials. And that uh, printed and written materials comes in a lot of different formats. And we're going to look at those formats today, particularly through visual literacy. We want to look at some ways that we interpret images or read images. And we also want to look at informational literacy. Just recently, I was talking to a school district. And they say, oh, yeah, our students are above grade level. And I was like, wow, that's really good because they don't get to work with a lot of school districts where the kids are reading above grade level. You know, it's like everybody is on grade level and a number of students grade level. And uh, the social studies teacher spoke up and said, well, yes, our students do read above grade level except when it comes to uh, in or nonfiction text. So I was like, oh, well, that's us. So let's take a look at the informational and uh, nonfiction text. And we're going to be look looking tonight at the many different ways atlases bring in an opportunity for us to work with informational text. And then we don't want to leave out technological literacy because that's becoming more and more important and even if we learn today by the time they graduate they're going to be doing things with technology that haven't been invented yet we don't even know where that will go so we definitely want to be sure that we're as up to date and current as possible when it comes to technology so those are some of the things we're going to be looking at this evening we'll start we'll start by looking at some visual literacy And these come from uh, atlases, our first through fifth grade. So I won't specify which one because I doubt that I can remember all of them. But A does come from our first grade atlas. And I love the way we connect a real photo with uh, the image that we see on maps. Because students oftentimes, if we don't give them that clear concrete picture, they don't really have an understanding of what that map representation really is. So in that visual literacy, we're trying to help the students not only see what it looks like on the map, but then also give them a frame of reference of what that looks like in reality. And then for B here, we're looking at what is a flat image, and we're having the students to up these colors to understand the elevation and understand that this is this is a tall feature even though it's on this flat page and so we're helping students to read or see in a lot of different ways read these images now this C down here on the bottom corner is very interesting I know 
And Melissa and I have done this a lot. One of my favorite acts is just to do I see, I wonder. Because when you do an I see, I wonder, you can lead the students then all the way into real inquiry. And so starting with an image like this with just five things you see in this image. And then what are five things you wonder about those things that you see? Well, they probably are going to see very tall buildings in the back, people. They're going to identify those basic things, those very elements that they see, and then we're going to say, now what does that make you wonder? And then based on their wonderings, we work in small groups and actually develop compelling inquiry questions. And so it's a great way to lead them into inquiry all on their own. So the role that our visual literacy plays is hugely important. Think of all many types of media that come to you throughout the day and the, the things that we have to decipher and figure out in that visual format. And then of course we wouldn't want to go without addressing textual literacy. One of the things that I think is really nice, especially in these early elementary atlases, is, is that we're identifying text feature students. And it doesn't just call it out and say, this is a title question, or this is a title, but it explains what that is about. Look here on the left-hand side where you see topic sentences. They will give you an idea of what is to come. So it's not just saying this is a, uh, a topic sentence, but it's explaining to you what that topic sentence actually does. So I love that we have in our new atlases now, we've called out these, um, these text features for, for the students. Another thing you might notice is we have moved away from some of the characters we've had previously in our atlases. And in this particular atlas, you can see that we have some insects. And that plays a very vital role because it's in our atlases that are going to be posing questions to us. And we're going to be looking at the world through their perspective. We talk about multiple perspectives. Well, now we're going to get the multiple perspective of some insects in this uh, first grade act, in the first grade atlas. And the second grade atlas, we're going to be moving to some birds and getting bird eye views uh, from different beautiful creatures. And then in the third grade atlas, we're actually going to be moving to a different type of animal because we're going to be looking at those animals that really uh, uh, build a biosphere, biosphere for other uh, animals and insects. So in that particular one, we're going to be looking at elephants and uh, a tortoise and a bat and uh, a beaver and the world kind of from their perspective. So I think you'll enjoy the, the role that these new characters are playing in our atlas as they bring to us these opportunities opportunities for the students to really engage with geography skills or history skills, but also with literacy. And then, of course, we want to kind of keep that element that we've always had in our atlases, text. It's really great to bring your low grade, your low level readers, bring your low level readers into your atlas. Atlas is going to have chunks of text supported by a variety of visuals and charts and graphs and maps that will help those level readers have a better comprehension of the text that they do read. So I pulled just a few different ones here that you can see and they're from first through fifth grade so it's a variety of text levels as well. But here was the uh, the, res, the compass rose, we can see that the text is really short. Here we have a map. Uh, a, a map is a drawing of an area, explains. And then this little part here, did you know, this is going to come from our fifth grade atlas and it has something different in it this time than we've ever included one of our atlases. I think you're going to like. It's going to be a legacy page and it takes something that's occurred in United States history and brings it all the way up to the present and connects to how is this legacy impacting us still. So that's going to be a really good one. But it also, again, gives us that short chunk text so that the students who do have difficulty reading 
can be supported by the, all the visuals and do that with uh, some other uh, types of chunk text that I've included here as well. So the literacy pieces that you're going to be finding in our atlas are going to be very nice uh, your on grade level as well as your below grade level students. And then of course you get into that informational text and that's that more dense we've got to understand it. Uh, it's not uh, reading a novel for pleasure. This is like we've got to get something out of this and this is the text that's most frequently um, utilized in, in all of our population is the text that we do. And we've broken that down here in much the same way as kind of we did our text uh, features earlier, but a little, a little more sophisticated level here. This is, I think, a grade uh, example. And look at all the fun stuff that's going on in this page. You've got your your uh, chunked text, but you also have an actual photograph. You have a bar graph. You have a map, a, a physical map. Uh, you also have a um, a map there at the bottom corner, which a layering perspective of the terrain and then you also have this one that we looked at a little earlier where you take a flat map and build it up so the students can understand that um, elevation that's occurring in the map even though it is flat on the page. Over on the right hand side you'll see that we've added in some additional pieces of information again kind of at that chunk text it's still not a lot of text but it's more text than what we used to have on a page and so what does that tell you if we have more text on a page than we previously had what might that hint at to you any ideas on that if you have an idea put it in the chat let me see what you think what might having more text a page clue you into? Well, it clues you in possibly to the fact that when our atlas is before, we're at a DOK level one. And now our atlases range from a DOK level to a DOK level three. So the more text per page definitely has increased our rigor, but that's not the only way that we've increased our rigor. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. One of the features that we do want to include, though, in our literacy is technological literacy. And look at some of the things we've included here. We know, or at least those at my age, know how to read a roadmap. Most of our students today are not going to be reading a roadmap when they get 16, 17 years old. Right now, we can already pull out our GPS. We can pull out our iPhone. We can go anywhere we want to go by using all wonderful tools. And uh, we want to be sure that we at Social Studies School Service bring the kids all the way into the future by including those technological literacy components. And so we've included that here. I think you'll see we've got a really nice focus on how we want to bring literacy in with our elementary students and geography. I did mention a while ago because we have increased our rigor from a DO1 to a DOK level 3. So now students will experience a range of DOK rather than just one DOK. That's really important to me. I think we, we really needed to increase that rigor and I'm really glad to see that rigor raised in our atlases. That rigor comes in many different ways. One of those formats is what I shared with you a moment ago. Where we're looking at uh, more text on the page raises the level of rigor. The vocabulary we use raises the level of rigor. We use uh, critical thinking is le our level of rigor. Notice on the right hand side of your screen the word compare. Compare automatically means that we're raising the rigor. Anna is raising the rigor. That's critical thinking. Why do you think we're drawing inferences and we're raising rigor by having the students draw inferences? Why do you think the oceans are the same color, both on a light picture of the world and on the map? And we let the students draw their inferences on why they think they're the same color. And then, of course, we will include geographical thinking in our geography atlases, of course. That's just kind of like 
uh, that's a necessity and one of uh, one of our major purposes, of course, of this, but we really want to target those five themes of geography. And I don't know about you guys, but I know it's so confusing sometimes, especially if you're not a content specialist of geography between place and region. Those three can get a little like, hmm, what's the difference between the three? Well, let me ask you this. How about in the chat, hit me up and tell me which one of these are you? Hmm. I live in Huntsville, Alabama, and it is the space and rocket capital of the world. Is that a location, a place, region? Tell me in the chat. What do you think? Location, place, or region? Janine says place. Mantra. Oh, yeah. You guys are doing really well on that. Thank you. It is a place. Right. It does doesn't have coordinates. We're not looking at latitude and longitude. So it's not a location. Location is going to have an exact pinpointed area that focus on uh, latitude and longitude coordinates and a region, area that's identified by a similar culture. Or, hmm, like how many of you have ever heard of the Black Belt? The Black Belt is in southern Alabama. I think it also extends into Georgia and Mississippi, but it's the area where rich soil is located. So that's a region. Let's take a look at a few of these. I'm sorry, I thought the next uh, slide for you of those. Let's see, this is, we're going to look at charts now and, and how charts, again, are informational text, but they're also allowing us an opportunity to engage with that geography vocabulary as well as sometimes historical information. I brought to you just a host of charts because charts come in many different formats. And uh, these are, as you can, I love the one here on the right about uh, the different regions. Look at that. That's regions, the Northwest Coast, California, Intermountain area, and the types of plant animals that are found in those regions. That's a great chart there. I also really like our chart down here about here's kind of how things escalated and the 1700s that get us up to the American run. Um, I don't know about you guys, I'm a very visual learner, and so I think deciphering charts for our students is a great way for them to really master those uh, informational texts and be able to text uh, as it gets further and further uh, up in rigor and in grade level. And then, of course, graphs, bar graphs, lines circle graphs or pie graphs, whichever you choose. We have a variety of those throughout our atlases and look at the way that they come. They're really done in a way that captures attention, but yet still focuses that data on something that is grade level appropriate for the student. Now these come from a range of different, I think most of these came from our fourth and fifth grade atlas. I love our bar graph here that shows uh, the percentage of people that are living in poverty in different countries of the world. And over here we, on the uh, left, on my left, I see growth in area and this is per square miles and where that growth is occurring, what year and how it has progressed. I really like the one at the bottom about the longest rivers. I just think that one is really nice and attractive. And so one of the things about graphs and charts and maps is they can serve as your hook, bring the students into and be interested in literacy and geography as you're launching into a unit because they're colorful and engaging, students do tend to uh, gravitate towards our atlases. I think you'll find your students too will enjoy utilizing these. A timeline is another great way to um, 
talk about a series of events a year or over the span of many years and our students need that opportunity to engage with what that timeline looks like and be able to decipher text from it as well as be able to create create timelines of their own and I don't know about you guys, but students don't draw inferences automatically. It's one of those wonderful skills that we get to teach them how to take different parts of information and bring it together to draw those inferences. And here you can see that we're giving them a variety of maps that are related related to uh, precipitation, related to North America, and we're letting them go through these different maps, and we're looking for them to draw some inferences as to the uh, and how that, uh, not population, sorry, <laughs> precipitation, precipitation, and how that precipitation might influence our land use. So another way for read maps, visuals, visual literacy, information literacy with our students. And then, of course, uh, when we're looking at an atlas, we want to include those things related to geography, such as location, place, region, movement, and human and environmental interaction. The image on the screen here is from our second grade atlas, and you can see birds that are on the globe here, and it's these birds who are our characters for this one who will give us different views of the world in our community. Location, I think Montreal said that earlier, uh, that uh, it, when I was talking about Huntsville, Alabama, I wasn't talking about a place that had coordinates, and location does have coordinates to have as your latitude, longitude, and that uh, identifies an area as a location because you're able to pinpoint it on that grid and a place. Don't you just love the Canyons? The Grand Canyon is a place. It's something that's identified not by, or, or at least not in my conversation now, by latitude and longitude, but by land form itself, which is a place, the Grand Canyon, and then we look at what then is a region. What region of the United States do all, all of you live in? I didn't take that at the big session today because I wanted to bring it in now and see what region you're in. So not what state, but in what region do you currently live? Share that with me if you would please. You already know I'm from and so Alabama, and I'm from the southeast. Where are you guys currently living? And Melissa, it's okay. I'll go ahead and open that chat so I can follow along. Oh, south central, east central, southeast, eastern central. Okay. Like we kind of got the east and the south taken care of today, but not much in the way of the southwest or northwest, right? Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. We're glad that you're here and getting to join in with us. The other components related to geography is movement. It's how people, ideas, and goods move. Now, I know some of you are in Texas. In Texas, one of the things that we saw uh, in the 1800s was the rise of it's because the railroads helped us to move that cattle from place to place. Look at the image of the forestry here on uh, the bottom where they're cutting in the timber, they're having to now, they're going to have to move timber to where it's needed. Anything that requires that movement of people, goods, or ideas, we're talking about geographical skills of movement. And then we talk about human environmental interactions. Humans do impact the environment, right? We all know that. We impact the environment by the fact that we're building cities, and I don't know about out where you are, but where I am, I see more farmland being taken for subdivisions, one of the fastest growing cities in the country. Although I think my last, uh, the last I heard was Idaho is now our, our fastest growing state. So they're losing some of their timber and their fertile uh, farmland for housing and manufacturing places. So we do impact our environment. And one of the new things you're going 
to find in our atlases is going to be a caution. So what are the ways that people change the environment and able to protect it? What are some things that we can do to help protect the environment? And your students will probably talk about recycling and things of that nature, and maybe even come up with ideas. But we do impact the environment, but the environment also impacts us, such as when we have natural disasters, um, whether it's a hurricane, a tornado, a fire, a snowstorm, ice storm, we're all uh, in the position of being targeted by some type of natural disaster. So no matter where we live, if there is something from nature impacts us, and here in North Alabama, I would say our biggest one is the fact that we have tornadoes, and we're not Tornado Alley, but we are Tornado Alley of the East, so we do get to that. And then, of course, a lot of you guys have experienced hurricanes, and if you're on that East Coast, you've had the hurricanes and the ice storms, and so we all have those things from the environment that also impact us. It is a two-way street. It's not just that the environment, but it also impacts us. Our new atlases will look differently, have different names than they have in the past. This is our second grade atlas, our place in the world. Oh, I'm sorry, great atlas, our place in the world. As you can see, we have our bat, and we have our elephant, and we have some other animals there that will share with you about their habitats and the way that they view the world. Also, what's new in our uh, atlas is these animals or birds here, as in our second grade atlas, they show you what the same place looks like, but from their viewpoint. And so it's kind of like that multi-perspective that we do in so many other things, getting it from the perspective of different birds. And you can see that we're looking at the same library building from different viewpoints. So that is one of the new features that you threw out our atlases for first, second, and third grade. Like I said, you'll also find a call to action. Uh, this, I think, is in our fourth and fifth grade atlas. I don't think this is in first, second, and third. And these different uh, fourth and fifth grade opportunities will be asking students, what is it that we can do? So we're really trying to get to that D4 out of the C3 framework, how do you communicate results or take action? And so we're giving opportunity for students to take action. Also, uh, one of the nurses in our fifth grade atlas is where we take something that occurred in history, such as the Columbian Exchange, and we bring it all the way up to the present day and look at what were those exchanges that took place? Are their legacy today? What, what has that left with us today? So here, we've taken the uh, fruit, the tomato, and we've brought it all the way into the future of how it's brought in different areas, but it's also, of course, brought us a fruit that's very common throughout the United States. So the legacy pages are new to the fifth grade atlas, and I think you will enjoy how these all um, bring historical events into the 21st century that kids can really connect to. So whether you've seen our new atlases in person yet or not, probably uh, varied. We don't have all of them quite produced yet, but we are uh, producing, I think, the first, second, and third grade ones now, and your local and specialist for social studies school service will be able to give you more information about when you can obtain your copy of the atlas and how much they'll be and how much those classroom sets will be. So if you were local specialist, go ahead and reach out to them. And if you don't know your local specialist, if you'll put that in the chat today and tell me what state you're with, I'll be glad to share with you who your specialist is. Of course, you can reach out to us at help at socialstays.com, and our customer service department will be glad to assist you in connecting with your uh, curriculum specialist or in getting an order placed for some of our new atlases. Do you have any questions about our atlases and the resources that they're going to be offering and how literacy is embedded in the atlas itself? I have a question. If 
Yes. Here. Um, I sorry if I had an internet problem, so I'm not sure if you already said this, but are the atlases meant to be um, just that you purchase every year, kind of workbook style, or do they get passed down from year to year? Are they reusable, or how does that work? Oh, great question. They are they are not consumables in terms of you don't have to rebuy them every year. Uh, if they're cared for, they'll last for a very long time. You know, um, five to ten years. I would I would say you probably don't want to go because you want to renew your atlases and have something that's more current. But uh, but yes, they're very durable. They do last a long time, and um, a classroom set should last you somewhere in the neighborhood of five. And do you five have activities years, that at, go at along? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have activities that go along with the atlas, or is that? Oh, that's it's a great question. Yes, actually are in development now, and they will be both print and digital activities that go along with the atlas. Oh, great. That's Good. excellent. Question, thank you. Thank Any you. other questions you have about the atlas? Oh, good, of course. Jeannie, uh, I put in uh, chat who your contact is, and Sarah, I contact in as well. If any of you need to know who your contact is, just let me know there in the chat, and I'll be glad to connect you to the right person and give you their email. Thank you. Other than that, let me just say thank you for joining us this afternoon, allowing us an opportunity to share the Atlas with you. Thank you. Melissa, are you ready to close this out for us? Take any last minute questions or whatever? Yes. Or are you still having tech no, logical I'm difficulties? So that will close our session tonight. I'm going to go ahead and